Our next topic will be infectious diseases and the speaker is Dr. C.R. Das, Academic Advisor, Nobel Medical College and Teaching Hospital, Nepal. And I invite Chairperson Dr. Girish, a well-known anesthesiologist and Dr. B.K. Prasad, Senior Anesthesiologist, Patna. And also Dr. Gupta. And Dr. Gupta from Dharmanga Medical College. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. C. R. Das. I think most of us know him, particularly the Patna people are very much obliged with him because I think he is a pioneer in critical care establishment at Patna when he was in HMRI. And though he is very close colleague to me, but I always think he is my guru in all aspects, by nature, by personality, by lectures. And I have, whenever I have met him, I found him on different academic administration. He had been to Mauritius for as advisor to Mauritius government for health and particularly the critical care. He was initially a pioneer establisher at Bokaro and he has moved everywhere. Most of his disciples are here and I am also one of him. So it is very difficult to tell about <laughs> Dr. C. R. Das. But, uh, and the second thing, the subject, which is a very, very important subject for our critical care management, the sepsis, a problematic, most of the time, we, I think, we do not succeed. But yes, our success rate is also not bad. But it is a problem. And I think we will elaborate on that subject as usual very nicely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Girish Babu. I never tell him, Dr. Sena, one of the reasons I, originally I wanted to thank Deepak and Kishore for inviting me, but my main reason of coming one and a half year back I left Patna. After that, I never had the opportunity to uh, to meet my friends like Professor Hai, Girish Babu, Birinder Babu. This was the, my main attraction of coming to Patna. Okay, this is the. Uh, Nobel Medical College and the hospice under which I am working now. My uh, three of my colleagues are with me. I shall be failing if I don't introduce them with, uh, in front of you. Dr. Rupak. Here, ah, he is Dr. Rupak. My right hand in is running the department. A very good friend of mine in the daytime. Evening, yeah, evening, maybe best friend in, my, in the bar. And second, Dr. Hemant, very intelligent, got married 20 days back. But still, still he has come here. And he has heard a lot about Deepak and Kishore to see what is happening with the critical care update. And third, Dr. Vikendra, he is the one who has made all the slides, so my thanks to him. But the greatest quality in him is, he does not speak lies, except if somebody's life is in danger. 
otherwise he will, he will never he will never tell lies so um, friends uh, initially i got um, i i got a bit scared when kishore gave me this subject critical care infection and tropical medicine so there are voluminous books and literatures on critical care infection mostly mostly the western books to which we are used to and uh, none of these books deals with the life saving life threatening complications of patients who are suffering from tropically infectious disease so when i when i talked with kishore that what should i talk he said sir if you can uh, talk on these patients who are occupying recently a large number of beds in icu or critical care units because no work has been done we are used to western books western books till now never mentions anything about how to manage this uh, tropical infectious disease who are acutely ill and are admitted in critical care so um, I, i thought it is a difficult start it would have been very happy i would have been very happy that if these three words critical care infection and tropical medicine could pop screen like a fantasy hindi movie the latest being i have seen that movie bhutnath returns and speak for themselves making my task very easy but as it is not possible so i'll make a few try attempt as the name was given by kishore critical care maybe i will spend 2 minutes or 3 minutes on that and rest of the times so i will spend to give you a birds eye view of what is drop acutely ill critically ill patients on suffering from tropically infectious disease has done in the past what they are doing now and what they can do in future and if time permits i'm sure time on permit a little bit about the few of the specific diseases i think i'll skip that off first of all what is critical care it is the care of seriously ill patients with life threatening illness or trauma also of patients who have the potential to develop life threatening complications from their diseases ideal to reserve this care for severe but potentially reversible problems who are the care providers all of you today it involves almost all major surgical and medical groups with the anesthesiologist playing the main role so please whatever it is don't make critical care unit is as a place for convalescence or rest like this or a place to declare death it is not a place to declare death as it is being done in some of the countries in the middle east so who runs as all of you are here as an intensivist way back in 1965 peter safer he defined an intensivist like this a scientifically trained highly motivated physician who has the action oriented attitude of the anesthesiologist and surgeon thoughtfulness of the internist and pediatrician the inquisitive data oriented mind of the scientist and the diplomacy of a united nations ambassador so uh, you people are all of you intensivists here are very great friends uh, i am a great fan of robert cole he has written this book that 100 years of journey through the medical so this book speciality is that it doesn't have any writing it is only full of real photographs of patients and equipments of last 100 years he start his book with this preface the past is the ground on which we walk and if we don't know the soil we are lost and sure to miss the future this holds good even today even today also uh, let us see how it is we say the western western books why why they don't deal with acutely ill tropical infectious disease the reason being put forward is maybe there is no there, there is no tropical infectious disease in that country was it really so i will just show three pictures from this robert cole's book 1900 city of florence see how a patient 
he is being transported out of the hospital, out of the city, with some food and medicine to be kept outside the outside the city till he dies. What was it? Was it plague or sepsis or a tropical infection? We don't know. Next, 1935, London's famous windmill theatre. The speciality of that windmill theatre is outside nowadays you don't find a nursing home without the banner of CCU because otherwise there are nursing home won't sell. Similarly, windmill theatre's banner was we never close. So as they put the banner, how they will close it? So all the artists at that time, the whole London city was suffering from a peculiar type of fever, myalgia, asthenia, lethargy. But still the show has to go on. So the doctor is giving some injection to the artists before they are, before they are going to the floor for the show. What was it? What vaccine was it? And what injection? Was it some antibiotic or some stimulant so that they can dance? Nobody knows this. And last, 63. This 1963, I was in the medical school. That time, end of 63 and 64, those who know, there was a scarcity of Hollywood films in the world market. No new films were getting released. All English films used to be old. Reason being, Hollywood was frightened. The Hollywood city was flooded with a peculiar type of Influ acute influenza-like fever, so the shooting was almost closed. But the famous stars, Betty and Stanley, they are brave enough to come for the shooting and they are rehearsing before the shooting like this. So what was it? Was it a HINA infection or dengue or something else? We don't know. My idea of presenting these three photographs is probably the tropical infections were there also in the western developed worlds, but maybe very, very, very few. They, these guys, they didn't know how to tackle this, how to diagnose this, how to treat that. So they, they used to avoid. And after 50 years, September 2010, the medical news and research from around the world, they made a caption that we, today we have our stethoscope and our microscope, we listen, we look and investigate to make a diagnosis and to treat our patients to struggle against the great foe, Mr. Death. So before that also, 50 years before also, these things were there, but these diseases were never diagnosed. So who is this Mr. Death? I have put this tropical infectious disease. It was not given in that. It was not given in that medical research. I thought that maybe this will fit in well. Again, per this millennium, there uh, he has reminded us about Robert Scholes saying that you must remember the past. Those who fail to read history are destined to suffer the reputation of its mistake. Friends, all of us know that a massive drive by the all NGOs and who's in 1940s and 1950s eradicated almost quite a good number of you know, tropical diseases or brought down the incidents. So we got very happy. We got very happy and what? So what was the result? The result was complacency set in, control programs were dismantled, resources dwindled, expertise were lost. So now today, some of the states in Africa, they don't have entomologists to guide, not a single entomologist. So how they will prevent the tropical infectious diseases? So 10 months back, World Health Day, the Director General of WHO said this, as a result of this complacency and uh, programs program withdrawal, Many tropical diseases rolled back with a vengeance, with more power and a vanished infrastructure for their control. This is the scenario today. This is the special issue which World Health Day brought out on, on the last year only, the how to, how to control these vector-borne diseases. See, today we claim that we are discussing so many advancements. Today we claim that medicine has advanced so much. 
almost every organ of the human body today is subjected to allographic transplantation. But what happened to Rengu? Last 50 years, there is a 30-fold increase in the incidence of Rengu. This is the WHO statistics of the last year. So, in spite of the fact that who recommended long back that 80% of the world's neglected population should have equal claim to health as because of the Almata Declaration, which is like that all human are social animals and eligible for a level of health that will permit them to lead a socially and economically productive life. Don't forget that India, India also was a signatory for the Almata Declaration. India government signed for this. So uh, all of you, the intensivists, you have got a moral binding for that. Now what has happened? That's why I put it, the tropical infectious disease, I, I feel, this is the fear of unknown, the fear of uncertainty, the fear of time. The tiger is coming to your town, please be careful. I don't know who is the tiger, probably uh, look at this, uh, look at this uh, vector. Whether he is dangerous or this tiger is dangerous. When I, I just, when I left Patna one and a half year back, my grandson came to see me off. He told me, Nanu, see a film. He brought a cassette known as Makhi. I don't know whether you people have seen it or not. See how a vector can do havoc. He has, he has spoiled all the modern arms and he ultimately he has succeeded. So we should be very careful very careful from these vectors. So threat of vector-borne diseases. I try to make you aware of what it is so that uh, you people should be careful on that. More than half of the world's population are at risk. One-sixth of the illness and disability of the world are due to vector-borne diseases. More than one billion people in the world are infected by vectors. More than one million deaths per year during last two decades, many traditional vector-borne diseases have become global. Vector of dengue is now found in more than 20 European countries. They say that we don't have tropical disease. Eight countries, the famous eight country study said that an average dengue episode means 14.8 lost days. And for an ambulatory patient who is at home, and for a guy who is in, admitted in the hospital, it is about 18.9 days. But no research, no work, till now, now we don't know what is the cost of a dengue patient who is admitted in uh, CCU. There is a 30-fold increase in the incidence of dengue. Before 1970, only nine countries had dengue, which is now in more than 100 countries. So, no, outbreaks of most of the tropical diseases are now more fatal than what it was in the past. Malaria is considered as the biggest killer now. Last year, WHO has declared that dengue, yellow fever, lymphatic filariasis paralyzes the health system and disrupts the economy of, and social life. 120 million people are currently infected with lymphatic filariasis out of which 40 million are disfigured and incapacitated. This is the, uh, if you treat, if they become all right, still there are some securely, because like blindness, permanent damage of central nervous system, disfigurement of face, disfigurement of legs and incapacitated, and all these things leads to loss of productivity, social exclusion, retarded economy, and poor becomes poorer. So, friends, 1997, Diamond has written a book, Guns, Germs and Steel. There, he argues about the dominant Eurasian. Not because of the fact that, that they are intellectual, their morale is good, but because of the political and geographical and environmental things. I think this thing fits in very well with the recent spread, recent spread of the vectors all over the world. Now see, the malaria, dengue, filariasis and Japani encephalitis, how, how it is capturing the all over the world. Last time when I went to Mauritius, I have seen 
that time in 2007, uh, Mauritius, reunion countries, they were just coming out of the effect of the chicken gunia. French government declared 100% people were affected in the reunion. And I have seen myself how all the ICU, CCU were, got vacated. Patients are being airlifted from one hospital to another country. So, why the tropical diseases are becoming global now? That is why probably the Western researchers are now coming out last three, four years. You find some literatures from the Western world also about how to manage these cases because of the ecological imbalance, climate change, intensive farming, dams, irrigations, rapid unplanned urbanization, population movement, population explosion, deforestation, nuclear experiment, increase in international travel and trade. I'll just, to, come, to, come, to confirm this, I'll just quote few lines from the Harrison's textbook of internal medicine. Between 1980 and 1996, mortality from infectious disease in the U.S. had increased by 64% to a level not seen since 1940s. So it is increasing. Now, so what is this tropical infectious disease? These are a group of infectious disease which are commoner in the tropical and subtropical region because of favorable climatic and environmental conditions. The common diseases are mostly the vector-borne, mostly affected are the young and the adults who are generally healthy and in the prime of their productive life, they are the breadwinners for the family and support for the societies. They are the one who gets involved. Who are the vectors? Vectors are the living organisms that can transmit infectious disease between humans and from animals to human. Mosquitoes are the best known vectors. Others are ticks, flies, sand fly, fleas, bugs, and freshwater snails. I have made a search through the, uh, through the, to, with the help of Dr. Vigendra. There how many tropical diseases are there from the books of community medicine, parasitology and others. I found that there are about 113 tropical diseases. Please go through it. If it is, uh, if it is wrong, please let me know. Out of which more than 44 are vector borne, more than 45 are bacterial, then more, almost 13 are viral, more than 6 parasites and more than 18 is about helminths. But out of these 113, WHO has classified it, neglected tropical disease 12 and common tropical diseases are 10. So our main thrust is on these 22. Out of which if 22 if you want to great, it is only 10. So now the medical science is concentrated only on these 10 <coughs> tropical diseases. I said they are occupying a large number of ICU and CCU beds. Why? Because of increased number of severe, fatal, life-threatening complications, overlapping clinical presentation, so diagnostic dilemma. You can't diagnose if, if the patient has got two diseases at a time. Unfavorable outcome is unacceptable because the, these patients are the breadwinners and it increases Dali's loss to start emergency empirical the homeostasis and compensation of organ system, microbial replication in spite of best efforts. One organ failure leads to another organ failure, the need for rapid diagnosis organ support and system. So timely transfer to ICU or CCU is very vital. At the beginning I said that there are lots of book I have found. See, Infection control resources till 2010, I made a search. Journals 9, all has got website. Organization 29, books 71. But none deals with the critical care of acutely ill tropically infectious diseases. So this, is the, this is the scenario. Response is long averted, long averted. No it was coming. Ultimately, we should be thankful to Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine they formed a consensus committee with 12 members. And the aim of that member is that to develop a consensus evidence-based statements and guidelines to manage these dreadful fatal tropical diseases. 
these are the names of the 12 members, I am not going to read that. The committee took up only seven common diseases. Who said 10? Out of that 10, the committee took only seven, namely dengue hemorrhagic fever, rickettsial infection, scrub typhus, malaria, typhoid, leptospiral, bacterial sepsis, and viral infections like influenza. This, I think recently, a few months back, Dr. Bikindra diagnosed one uh, scrub typhus uh, in our uh, CCU. The patient became all right. The, they reported, they reported on the basis of literature, personal experience. So, in three parts, their recommendation. First part was, they accepted some statements already given by others that they have accepted in total. Second, agreed like previous worker on a syndromic approach to man diagnose and management. And third, the most important, formulated a guideline for the diagnosis and management of these seven dreadful diseases. What are the recommendations which they have accepted? Severe fatal cases should be admitted in ICU and CCU. Management should start immediately. Suspect tropical infections in all febrile cases. Delay in specific therapy increases morbidity and mortality. Please remember overlapping other tropical infections with bacterial sepsis. Life-saving interventions should always be done. Start empirical therapy immediately on arrival. Please remember, no guideline, no guideline, no recommendation for empirical therapy. Please depend on experience, epidemiology, weather, climate, environment. Heat wide and heat fast. Describe, then de-escalate after diagnosis. Proper timely communication about the prognosis. Regular monitoring. Periodic review of diagnosis and management, very important. If you need to change your diagnosis, periodic review of diagnosis and management, specific management should always accompany the general guideline. So this is second part is the syndromic approach. Seven diseases they have taken. Common figure in all seven, they found it is fever and some other common signs and symptoms. On that basis, they have put all these seven diseases under five syndrome. And mm, these syndromes are undifferentiated fever, undifferentiated uh, fever, the first one, like malaria, scrub typhus, leptospirosis, typhoid fever, dengue, and common viral diseases. Second group, fever with multi-organ dysfunction, like hepatorenal syndrome, which gives rise to leptospirosis, malaria, scrub typhus, fulminant hepatitis, bacterial sepsis, dengue, hunter A and E virus. Third group, fever with the rash thrombocytopenia, which gives rise to bleeding, like dengue hemorrhagic fever, malaria, leptospirosis, rickettsial infection, measles, rubella, viral infections, he also found, not in, not in the seven diseases, not in that group, also found in yellow fever, Lasha, Hunter virus, Ebola, Crimson Pongo hemorrhagic fever, Rubeola, Varicella, and disseminated heartbeat simplex. Fourth group, fever with ARDS, most, most common cause of CCU admission in India. The, as for example, scrub typhus, malaria, Influenza, HIA9, leptospirosis, hunter virus, infectious mononucleosis, pneumonia due to legionella and streptococcus, then diffuse alveolar hemorrhage due to collagen vascular diseases. And the last group is fever with encephalopathy. Always there will be some altered mental status. The encephalitis due to herpes simplex, Japanese B and other virus, meningitis like pneumonia, Nigeria, hemophilus influenza, enterovirus, and scrub typhus, cerebral malaria, typhoid, encephalopathy, hepatic failure, and brain abscess. So, a few, I think discussing pathophysiology will be uh, out, of, uh, out of my purview, but just for fever with ARDS, already it has been discussed, so direct and insert mortality is average about 50%. So
So we should be very careful. I think we will skip off. But only thing I'll say, last outbreak of leptospirosis in India, it has caused more. Month fatality was 43% leptospirosis epidemic. Brazil, is what it was 53%. In, in the island of Sicily, Thailand and Argentina, main cause of death was ARDS. So priority, priority of ARDS treatment here is whatever the first speaker said is different. Here, first is stop alveolar hemorrhage. Because uh, they say that in leptospirosis, the patient's lung himself gets drowned in his own blood. That is the language they use. So first is stop alveolar hemorrhage, resume gas exchange and then give hemodynamic support. Fever with bleeding, the main cause in India is because of the immune dysfunction, bone marrow suppression, DIC, hypersplenism, drugs like cunin and low plat platelet may come down up to even low, below 5000, giving rise to severe GI bleed, hepatic encephalopathy, hemorrhage, all, all bleeding manifestations. I am not going to discuss this. So management of disease, how do you manage this? In modern times, whoever, first, starting from first, I think up to the last speaker, will all speak of guidelines, algorithm, protocol, impression, expert opinion. At my age, I must give expert opinion. That is what we feel. But it may not be correct. And options. So these are the, these are the six words on which we did depend on management of any disease. But we shouldn't forget, definitely it has got value and we should follow that, but we shouldn't forget that scientific foundation should be trustworthy. When you put evidence-based modalities on which you have taken the evidence, that should be trustworthy. Science has a limit. Where it ends, empiricism begins. Same disease is almost never exactly similar in two patients. In two individuals, same disease cannot give the same signs and features. Why? Because individual adaptation of the disease. I will adapt a disease in a different way than Girishma. So it has to be different. You can't put, you can't put the same thing. That my message is guidelines should not be the dictus. Don't forget guidelines, protocols sometimes give rise to tunnel vision. See what is happening in the CCU. The consultant intensivist has come the, and the resident is telling, Sir, we have done all investigation including CT, PET CT, MRI, ING, everything. Then the consultant is telling, then what for you called me? Start the protocol or the guideline. Poor patient gets up. Sir, one investigation is still left could you please do that? So what is that? Clinical examination. Nobody has touched me till now. Nobody has examined me. I think it is only Dr. Samardar who has stressed the importance of uh, clinical investigations. So my, my suggestion is clinical judgment in the recognition and treatment of critically ill patients, particularly for overlapping tropical disease, remains of supreme importance. Well-designed, evidence-based guidelines or protocols should supplement and not supplant or assert clinical judgment. This is what I feel. Say the guideline, Government of India latest guideline for managing dengue, 39 pages. Can you remember 39 pages and treat a patient? It is, that is why the uh, ISCCM should be congratulated that they have come out with a very precise guideline which I will show you. Now, this is the committee which has done from this, it has come only last year. The very short, precise, easy to remember and easy to implement. One algorithm, two flowchart which tackle seven tropical diseases. So general management should be done like hypotension and if there is a conjunctive leak, vasoactive support, thrombocytopenia, bring up the platelet at least up to 20. Renal failure, do emergency dialysis. There is a thigh study that in case of cerebral malaria, CRRT definitely, definitely improves better result. Hepatic encephalopathy management, myocarditis, continued monitoring and arrhythmias, ARDS, urgent intensive ventilatory support and pulse dose of steroid. 
are not put bed here nursing because probably very few countries can do that. Only greatest example, I, as far as I remember, is the last, the last outbreak of SARS. Singapore was the only country who has done complete barrier service and they have saved 400 patients. 400 patients, but the amount of money they have spent on that is unimaginable. So, but whatever you do, friends, nothing can be made, no guideline, no protocol, nothing can be made foolproof because fools are so ingenious. So, but still, the I think ICMR guidelines, uh, the, the Critical Care Association guidelines, we should try to follow. I'll just try to explain. It looks clumsy, but it is very easy to follow. This is the flowchart one. As soon as the patient comes, assess and stabilize airway, breathing, and circulation. Look for the red flag features. Then first ask focus of infection, try to identify. Once you got that focus of infection, if you find focus of infection like pneumonia, pyelonephritis, biliary sore, cellulitis and so many other things, go for appropriate investigation including two blood culture, finish it off. If you can't find the source of infection, then assess the clinical syndrome, the five syndrome for seven disease, we said five syndrome, assess the clinical syndrome, consider the risk factor, geography, session and associated symptoms. This can lead you to two ways, fever with encephalopathy, one, and there are the rest again four, fever with rash and thrombocytopenia, one, jaundice, ARDS and MODS. So five diseases are be, the syndromes have been taken care of here. Fever with encephalopathy, management of which we will show you in flowchart two. And fever with rash, thrombocytopenia, jaundice and ARDS, MOD. If you suspect this, then investigation. Essential for all cases. At least two blood cultures should be done. Others are CBC, platelet, electrolyte, CRP, creatinine, LFT, urine analysis, chest X-ray. But rapid diagnostic test should be done as soon as the patient gets admitted. Then this will segregate three diseases. First one is malaria, but please, if you are using malaria rapid card test, you should be using HRP or LDH and antigen strips should be used. Malaria smears should be done at least for three, three smears. Then dengue card test should be done for NS1 antigen, IgM and IgG, then do the typhi dot and HINIPCR. If Rapid test suggests malaria, dengue, or if it is, yes, malaria, dengue, or typhoid. If it is typhoid, start injection of reaction, 100 mg per kg per day. If it is dengue, isotonic fluid, supportive care, and bleeding electrolyte abnormalities. Again, I will uh, remind Dr. Samadhar, please, so many patients in the past has died of dengue because of overtransfusion. So whatever is needed should be given. If there is a blood loss, then only blood should be given. And uh, third one is malaria. If it is malaria positive, then start injection of artesanate, 2.4 milligram per kg at admission, then at 12 hour and 24 hour and then once a day. If all these rapid tests does not suggest these three disease, then start empirical treatment. Again, depend on, depend on the epidemiology season, personal experience, because there is no guideline. So, injectio septriaxone, 100 mg per kg per day, plus tablet doxacilin, 5 mg per kg per day, plus or minus azithromycin, 10 mg per kg per day. Then, further workup should depend on as indicated. Please go ahead for serology for scrub typhus, dengue, leptospirosis, bidal, ultrasound abdomen, bone marrow examination if possible. This about the antigens I have already mentioned. Now this is the second flow chart that has started with the flows. If this is the fever with encephalopathy, then assess and support again ABC. Once you have done that, after that do the blood glucose. There should be facilities of POCT with every CCU. So as, uh, once you support ABC, then do the blood glucose. 
it, if it is low, give dextrose. If it is high, give insulin infusion. Then after assessing the glucose, do the hydration <coughs> status. If dehydrated, give normal saline. After hydration status, see for seizure. If, if seizure is no, if yes, go for anti-epileptic. If it is no, then good history and physical examination. But look for focal signs and features of raised ICP. If there is a you know, focal raised ICP is raised, then give give anti anti raised therapy, hyper controlled hyperventilation, three percent saline, mannitol, steroid, and control of fever and seizure. After this, go for go for neuroimaging, CCT, MRI. If CCT and MRI shows the diagnosis, go for specific therapy. If it does not show, then for presumptive therapy. This part is over. Now, if there is no local sign of feature or raised ICP, do lumbar puncture. Once you do the lumbar puncture, go for specific test for glucose, gram stain, CSF for counts, then agglutination test. This may give rise to diagnosis point out, then go for go for a specific therapy. If it is not, go for presumptive therapy and then do vidal serology for strap typhus, leptospirosis, dengue, Japani encephalitis, and then it, this will definitely clinch the diagnosis and go for the empiric therapy. The specific disease, I thought I'll com to complete, I'll talk, but I don't think that uh, we'll talk on specific therapy. Rather, only thing is that uh, for the diagnosis, for the dengue, I'll say that uh, do uh, the leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hematocrite should be more than 20%. Uh, uh, remember, dengue, you always said hematocrite should be more than 20%. But you can come across situation where suddenly there is a hematocrite uh, fall. And if this fall is more than 20%, that means it is dengue septic shock percent is going. So please don't forget that. Tunica test is very good for that. And criteria for discharge, it is, uh, it should be remembered, this is by the government of India, absence of fever for at least 24 hours without any drug, return of appetite, sorry, return of appetite, visible clinical improvement, Good urine output, minimum of two to three days recovery from shock, no respiratory distress, platelet count more than 50,000. This should be there. I, I, I think we should sk skip off these specific diseases. Rather, I'll come to the, mm, now the, I wanted to talk about the treatment part, rather I'll go to the conclusion, because the time is going short. Preventive medicine for tropical infectious diseases currently faced with problems of population explosion, insecticide resistance, silent spread of vectors, and return of some eradicated tropical disease in more virulent forms. So it is becoming a global now. High tech, costly curative medicine is not able to penetrate the periphery, justifying the old word of way back in 1849 that medicine is a social science and politics is a medicine on a large scale. Severe fatal infected cases should always be admitted in ICU, CCU and it occupies a large number of beds. Most of these diseases have overlapping features, no vaccine, no specific therapy. And the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine for the first time has come out with a specific guideline by a consensus committee to diagnose and manage these diseases. This should be followed, and if anybody finds any new finding, should report to the Indian society. Friends, a time has come, we should be ready to tackle a rare and exotic infection, like SARS, avian influenza, Ebola, rose fever, chikungunya, Nipah virus, and so on. My take home message, I, I, I'd like to quote few authors, like, infectious disease will last, as long as humanity itself, tropical infection diseases are gradually becoming global. Nothing is more international than disease. Health and disease have no geographical and political boundaries. A stitch in time saves nine. 
the need of many must prevail over those of few. Tropical countries should do more research work on tropical disease. ICU and CCU beds should liberally be allotted to severe and overlapping tropical infectious disease patients. Friends, go back home by taking this oath of the, as advocated by Director General of Health Services in the last World Health Day. No one in the 21st century should die from the bite of a mosquito, a sand fly, or a black fly or a tick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Siyatas, for your detailed and interesting celebration on this topic. And your take-home message was very, very loud and clear that we should be more careful and kind to the patient of infectious disease. It is one area where most of the patients are neglected, hardly, hardly to find any bed in ICCU. We need more ICCU and we, we should be very careful about this question. There are so many learning points. Now this session is open for questions. Please, you can ask questions. Sir, Dr. Bhattacharya from Microbiology Department, Ames, Patna. I had just uh, one point to make regarding malaria diagnosis. Uh, it has been found that uh, although PCR and other diagnostic tests have come up, rapid diagnostic tests, still the smear is the gold standard, I think. Pardon? Uh, blood smear, peripheral blood smear is still yeah. the gold standard diagnostic test, especially thick blood smear, if it is uh, made correctly. Thick, thick blood smears, you should. Three, this is the rapid test diagnosis, I told you, no? Later on, you have, will have to go on correctly. Uh, the specific disease, I have discussed everything, but due to shortage of time, I didn't come, uh, I, I didn't discuss this. So, for the malaria, In this specific diseases, everything I have given, but uh, as the time was getting short, so I thought that I'll, for the uh, treatment for the malaria, there are two studies for the below 15 years, they have done aquamet study, and adults, they have done a sequamet study, which has been accepted. First line is injectio artesunate, as I have told the dose. This uh, is plus, they will give you doxycycline also. And nowadays, doxycycline injection also they are trying to, trying to find out. Alternative, you can give quinine, doxycycline, and for pregnant ladies, you can give clindamycin. Instead of doxycycline, you can give clindamycin. And exchange transfusion, you should venture only when if there is a parasite in here. Yes. When you talked about uh, management of fever with ARDS, you stressed upon the attention towards clearing up pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, now it is easier said than done. Pulmonary alveolar hemorrhages tend to be almost uh, terminal uh, events in this kind of situations. Uh, you have said that you tackle uh, pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage and uh, try to improve oxygenation in this patient. That's number one question that I asked. And the second question is, again, later on in your lecture, you said about uh, ARDS in this kind of tropical illness, and you suggested, and it was just a suggestion, that consider steroids. Now, in both the situations, I would like you to clarify, I know you had less time, but I would like you to clarify as to what approach do you have in this? The, about the steroid, they said give only one dose, pulse dose. About but this is the this one dose of how much? This this would well, be the, for me the pulse dose of steroid would be one gram methylprednisolone. Would you recommend that? Yeah. That is what they are telling that give one pulse dose of steroid and about the uh, inter uh, ventilatory support we have to give uh, non-invasive ventilation doesn't have any role. They said give invasive ventilatory support. But if the lung is being flooded with blood. Even if you intubated the patient, you are not likely to get gas exchange. How do you propose this to get the, gas this exchange? Is, this is the problem now in uh, dengue. They say that 
more than 80% patients they die because of this. They, they say that lung gets drowned in their own hemorrhage. So first, first try to all these things you have to do together: stopping of hemorrhage, poor oxygenation, and steroids. They say all these three should be started together. Would you recommend bronchoscopy for removal of blood? Bronchoscopy. If the source is there, tap is open. If you drain it also, it will go on opening. So best, yeah, bronchoscopy is a. I have not come across that uh, bronchoscopic removal, but they say that stoppage of hemorrhage means whatever means you can think of, try to stop that hemorrhage. Bronchoscopy is not going to stop the hemorrhage. It will, it will, it will buy your drain time. It, out. it will buy your time at least. Oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, that would be. I have a question regarding this, this slide. Pardon? I have a question and comment regarding this slide. Yeah. The, uh, of course, it is by consensus that uh, artisanate is the first choice. But what I found in my practice, quinine hardly ever fails. Artisanate fails. Quinine, I, I have seen very few cases failing. So, my choice is uh, quinine. Of course, considering the uh, side effect and this. Quinine and side, that is because of the side effects, only that this sequamate study and acromate study has shown that quinine is very effective, there is no doubt. But the uh, side effects are uh, too many. That is side it. effects are too many. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now this session concludes.